Today is our last Sunday going through our Sunday classic sermon series. And so we've been looking at different Old Testament stories and relating them to, to our situation, to where we're at today. And so today we're going to look at a very interesting book of the Bible. Uh, the book is Esther. Uh, and so in your Old Testament near Job uh, is the book of Esther. And we want to begin this morning uh, by reading the first four verses of Esther chapter 1. And we're going to go through the bulk of the book, but we'll not read it all, okay? I know some of you are like, oh no, um, this guy can make four verses go for an hour. What's he going to do with the whole book? We're going to cruise, I promise. Esther 1 verse 1. It came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, this was the Ahasuerus who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. In those days, when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel, that in the third year of his reign he made a feast for all his officials and servants, the powers of Persia and Media, the nobles and the princes of the province being before him, when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his excellent majesty for many days, 180 in all. Now that means to you nothing, right? I mean, who's this guy? Well, he's a, he's a king and he threw a big party. But the Bible does tell us a couple of things and I want to try to put it into some context as we begin. Ahasuerus is also known as Xerxes. So this is the king who is the son of Cyrus. So we talked about this a little bit, that Daniel, from Daniel in the lion's den, Daniel was in the king's uh, house and served the king all the way up until Cyrus. And Daniel died sometime during the reign of Cyrus. We also, last week, talked out of Haggai and talked about how that the nation of Israel, the Jews, were allowed to come back to Jerusalem after being put in captivity or, uh, and, and Jerusalem being, being ransacked, being sacked, the temple being destroyed, and they laid the foundation of the temple during the reign of Cyrus. But it was during the reign of Xerxes or Harris, uh, uh, Her I'm, I'm going to struggle with that all day, I promise, Ahasuerus, it was during his reign that the temple was rebuilt. So this is the time, the context in, we, in which we are. And the Bible says that in the third year of his reign, he throws a huge party. Now, a couple of things happen in chapter one. He throws this party, and towards the end of chapter one, he calls, he, the Bible says that he's, he's joyful with wine, he gets a little drunk, and he calls for his wife, the queen, who's throwing her own party for the, the wives and the women of the governors and the princes. He calls for her to come in to show off her beauty. And she says, nah, I, that does not sound like something I want to do. So she refuses the king. We're told that Eventually, she's put away. She's no longer the queen. The Bible's not real descriptive on what happens to her, but Vashti, the queen, is no longer on the scene. Historically, we know that between chapters 1 and 2 of Esther, the king goes and makes war, moving into Europe, and makes war against the Greeks. This, this um, banquet may very well have been uh, a, a precursor to this great campaign that he mounts. And uh, some of you may have heard about the Battle of Thermopylae, where the Greeks uh, held off the, this great army of Xerxes and had a victory. Uh, they, they were ultimately defeated, but the victory was, was how long they held them off and the damage that they did to this army. And so Ahasuerus the king returns from that somewhat humiliated. 
And in chapter two, some of his advisors say, hey, listen, what you need to do is you need to get another queen. And you're the, you're the king over all of these provinces, and so tell all of the governors, all of the leaders, that you want the, the, the best women, the, the, the most attractive women to come and compete to be your queen. And for a year, the Bible says, these women prepare. And one of the women is a woman named Esther. Esther was a Jewish woman. She was an orphan. Her mother and father had died, and her uncle Mordecai raised her. And uh, most theologians will tell us that Mordecai was most likely a scribe in the court of the king. So he's around the king, but his primary job is copying things down and writing things. He's not, it's not a bad position, but he's not in the highest place either. And Esther is one of these women. And in verse two, or in chapter two, Esther is made queen. Not only that, but um, there's, a, there's a little incident at the end of chapter two where Mordecai overhears a couple of the doorkeepers of the king. They're angry with the king, and they form a plot to, to kill the king. Mordecai reports that through Esther, and the plot is foiled, and the king it is not it, his life is not taken from him, and these doorkeepers are dealt with. In chapter three, we're introduced to a man by the name of Haman. Haman is a political figure who is angling for his own power and angling to be close to the king, and and the Bible says that he is the the most trusted advisor or ally of the king. And Haman is respected and he's feared. So much so that when he walks through the court, the people that are there bow to him and pay homage to him as they would the king. Except for this one scribe. This one guy. Mordecai. Mordecai doesn't bow to Haman. And this gets under Haman's skin. Matter of fact, we're going to see that Haman is really bothered by this. You ever had a coworker at work that really bothers you? Haman did. I mean, it bothered Haman so much. And, and, and what Esther tells us is that Haman probably had the clout to just take care of Mordecai. But he heard that Mordecai was a Jew, and so he plots a greater plan. He goes to the king and he said, I don't know if you've heard of these people, the Jews. Nebuchadnezzar crushed their city in Jerusalem and they're scattered throughout the kingdom. But if you read their history and if you, if you study, these people are troublemakers. You know what you ought to do? You ought to make, a, let's, let's make a law that says on this day, People can just kill Jews. Matter of fact, what Haman did was he had uh, lots cast before him. He went through some kind of a process. Uh, we might think of it as like rolling of dice or maybe something like a Ouija board, but he came up with a very specific date. And that date was almost a year's time from when they were at right now. It was the end of the year. They were at the beginning of their year as they kept their calendar. And so he says to the king, on this date, let people be able to kill the Jews and let them be able to take their stuff. And matter of fact, I'll give some money to your, to your treasury so that we can make this happen. And the king's like, okay, sounds good. He writes out this, this letter, this law. And it goes out throughout all of his kingdom. And the end of chapter 3 says this. It says that Haman and the king sat down to have a drink. But that the city was in turmoil and chaos over this law. And so we come to Esther 
chapter 4, and we're going to work through this this morning as we kind of see the events that take place. In Esther chapter 4, beginning in verse number 1, it says, When Mordecai learned all that had happened, talking about the issuing of this decree, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. This seems like an odd sort of picture here, but this was was fairly common that someone who was in great distress would dress in a way that indicated that. I, I'm not sure exactly that we have anything to really equate it to. I guess if you see someone out, you know, in sweatpants and, and a T-shirt, and they're, that, that's probably not the same. They might have just been lazy that day. We really don't have anything like this. But a, a person would have been weeping, wailing, it says, Mordecai was. It was obvious that he was in great distress. And this scene was played out all throughout the kingdom. And Esther is made aware of this. So Esther's maids and eunuchs, verse 4, came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. Then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, whom he had appointed to attend to her, and she gave him a command or a message concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in the front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasury to destroy the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, that she might uh, command, that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him, to plead before him for her people. So Hathak returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. And so at first, Esther's like, I don't know what's wrong with my uncle. This person that had raised her that she looks at as a father, but she sends out clothes for him. Hey, whatever you need, I'll take care of it. Whatever's going on, it can't be that bad. But Esther didn't understand how bad it was. She's insulated. She's isolated as the queen. But Mordecai begins to explain to her what's going on, and he says, what you need to do is you need to go to the king. You can do this. Verse 10 says, then Esther spoke to Hathak and gave him a command or a message from Mordecai, for Mordecai. She said this, all the king's servants and the people of the king's province know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king, who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. Esther says, listen, there's a rule. If you walk into the king's presence uninvited, there's a standing order. You're killed. The king doesn't have to say, kill her. He doesn't have to do anything. You're just, it's a death sentence to walk into the presence of the king uninvited, period. The only exception is if the king sees you and decides to grant you mercy, he'll take his scepter and raise it and hold it towards you, saving your life. And then Esther says this, I haven't been invited into the king's presence in a month for 30 days. Yes, she's the queen. She has servants and maids who attend to her. Uh, Her life is good, but she seems to be isolated 
from the inner workings of the kingdom. And certainly she's isolated from the king. She says, the king hasn't wanted to see me for a month. And you want me to run in to his presence? He's already gotten rid of one queen. He may just decide to get rid of a second. And Mordecai says this to Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mordecai says, listen, the Jews will get deliverance, maybe from you, maybe from some other place, but this may be what God has for you. This may be your time. Who knows but what you have come to the kingdom for this exact moment. And so Esther responds to that message and she tells Mordecai, uh, she replied to him, go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. This is verse, or this is all of chapter 4. We know that in chapter 5, after three days of fasting, Esther, in fact, goes into the presence of the king. The king sees her, and he raises his scepter towards her. Not only does he spare her life, but he says to her, listen, Queen Esther, make a request of me. What is it that you want? You can, it's yours up to half my kingdom. And Esther says, what I would like is for you to come to dinner with me tonight. I'm going to prepare a dinner, and I'd like you to come. And bring your most trusted advisor, bring Haman. And so the king and Haman dine with the queen that night. At dinner, the king says, now, Esther, I, I've come to dinner, but I know that you have a greater request than just supper plans, and so what would you ask of me? Up to half my kingdom, I guarantee it's yours. And Esther says, come to dinner tomorrow night. Come to dinner tomorrow night, bring Haman, and I'll let you know my request then. And so the king says, okay. And Haman leaves that dinner, and he is on cloud nine. I mean, it's the king and the queen and Haman. Nobody else. He's the man. I mean, he's, you know, the VIP place, but then you know the place that you can't even see from the VIP place? That's where Haman is. I mean, he's in the elite of the elite. And he's walking home and he's happy. And he sees Mordecai. And it all goes away. That Mordecai. Matter of fact, he goes home and he's he's troubled and he's upset. He's just had dinner with the king and the queen. He was specifically invited by the queen. He's in the inner workings of the kingdom. It doesn't get any better than this for a guy like Haman. And yet, all he can think about is Mordecai. And his wife is there and he calls his friends there, his advisors there. And he's talking about it and they say, you know what? You're Haman. Just kill him. Matter of fact, the Bible says that he erected a gallows. Now, I did some reading, and some, uh, some scholars say that it, it was something to hang somebody by their neck, a way to kill them that way. Others say it may have been some kind of a pike to, to just impale them on. Either way, the, the Bible says it's 50 cubits tall. Now, a cubit, it was generally the distance between a man's the, the tip of his finger to his elbow, about 18 inches. 
It's about 75 feet. You know, the top of our steeple is between 50 and 60 feet. This guy didn't just want to kill Mordecai. He wanted all his neighbors to know he was dead. This was the level of, of, of spite that he had for him. And so this is what his wife and his advisors say. They say, first thing tomorrow morning, go to the king and ask for the life of Mordecai. And Haman says, all right, that's what I'm going to do. But an interesting thing happened that night. Because the Bible says that that night, the king couldn't sleep. And so he called for the record of his kingdom to be brought to him. I mean, after all, if you really need some sleep, just call for some government records to be read to you. That's what I was thinking. And they're reading them to him. And they come to this story where Mordecai, in his court, revealed a plot to kill the king. And it was sent through Esther, and it was recorded. And the Bible says it was recorded in the very presence of the king, but apparently the king hadn't really paid attention. And it's nearing morning, and the king hasn't slept. And the king says, what was done for Mordecai? How do we reward him? And they, and they look at the records, and they say, nothing. And the king says, is anybody around? And they look into the outer court. And guess who's at work first thing in the morning? Guess who's excited to get the day started? Haman. And his servants of the king say, Haman's out there. And so the king says, well, bring him in. I mean, it's looking up for Haman, isn't it? Spoiler alert, it's not. So Haman comes in, and he's about ready to ask for the life of Mordecai. But before he can do that, the king says, hey, listen, what if I wanted to honor someone? Hmm, Haman's thinking. Who's the king going to honor? Maybe a special dinner guest last night and tonight? I mean, who would the king want to honor more than me? And so this is what Haman says. Get a robe that was worn by the king himself. You know, a game-worn jersey? Get, get, get a robe that was worn by the king and put this guy in that robe and on the very horse that would, that would haul the king and make a parade for him and parade him through the city and let everybody know that you want to honor that guy. And the king says, that, Haman, is a great idea. Haman, that is why I have you right here with me. That's why you're my closest advisor. And Haman's thinking, yeah. He goes, so go get Mordecai and do that to him. It was a rough day for Haman. So they did. They put Mordecai in the robe and they put him on the horse and they paraded him through the city. And the Bible says that just as Haman was finishing up this task, the servants of the king arrived to take Haman to dinner with the king and queen. And so he goes to dinner and they're enjoying dinner, and the king again addresses the queen, and he says, listen, what do you want? Up to half my kingdom, I promise you, I will give it to you. And the queen says this. She says, a great evil has sought to destroy me and my family and my people. And the king says, what is this evil? And the queen says, it's Haman. And the indication of the king is that he's got a pretty hot head. 
The Bible says that he gets up and he goes out to the garden. He can't even be, a, he, he can't stay in that room. He's got to go out to the garden. He's so angry. And Haman realizes that his bad day just got worse. And so the Bible says that he begins to beg the life of the queen, his own life, to the queen. We don't know exactly what transpired, but when the king walks in, Haman is laying on the couch that the queen is sitting on. And you can imagine his distress, but that is not how the king interprets it. He says, oh, not only are you going to try to kill all of her family and her people, but you're going to assault the queen? And they grabbed Haman. The Bible says they covered his head. They put, they, they put a bag over his head. This plot is exposed. And somebody says, you know, Haman built a big old gallow right at his house. And the king says, hang him on it. And Haman's killed. Before he's killed, the king takes his signet ring, the ring by which a decree would be sealed with the very seal of the king himself that Haman had. And he takes it from Haman and he gives it to Mordecai. And Mordecai becomes the advisor to the king. They create another law because they can't do away with the law that has been created that people can attack the Jews, but they say that the Jewish people can defend themselves. And, and they say that, uh, that, they can, uh, that they can defend themselves and that the government will help them. And the Jews got a great victory on that day instead of being decimated. And the Bible says that Mordecai continued to be elevated in the kingdom, to be trusted by the king. Just a couple of applications I want us to make for us this morning. The first is this. When all seems lost, it doesn't mean it is. Esther chapter 3 and verse 12 says this. The king's scribes were called on the 13th day of the first month, and a decree was written according to all that Haman commanded, to the king's satraps, to the governors who were over each province, to the officials of all people, to every province according to its script, and to every people in their language, in the name of King Ahasuerus. It was written and sealed with the king's signet ring. And the letters were sent by couriers into all the king's province to destroy, to kill, to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their possessions. And a copy of the document was to be issued as law in every province being published for all people that they should be ready for that day. The couriers went out and hastened by the king's command, and the decree was proclaimed in Shushan, the citadel. So the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Shushan was perplexed. In that moment, it seemed like all hope was lost. Think about how Mordecai reacts to it. He tears his clothes. It, that's the end of chapter three, and we, we roll right into chapter one. He puts on sackcloth. He wails, and he weeps, and that scene is, is duplicated all throughout the kingdom. Why? Because it seems as if the end is coming, and there's no hope. But God was at work. See, just because we can't see how God is going to resolve a situation does not mean he's not going to resolve it. Now, the easiest thing from our perspective would be the law's not made, right? That Haman just wouldn't have had the ear of the king and that the king would have had a, enough wisdom to recognize the, the, the 
terribleness of this law. From our perspective, it would just be, why couldn't this just have not happened? But even when we think there's no hope, it doesn't mean it's true. In Esther 9, it says this, now in the 12th month, that is the month of Adar, on the 13th day, the time came for the king's command and his decree to be executed. On the day that the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, the opposite occurred. In that, in that the Jews themselves overpowered those who hated them. The Jews gathered together in their cities throughout all the province provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm and no one could withstand them because fear of them fell upon all people. And all the officials of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and all those doing the king's work helped the Jews because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. For Mordecai was great in the king's palace and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For this man, Mordecai, became increasingly prominent. You see how God took a horrible thing and gave the Jews a victory out of it? It took almost a whole year. It wasn't easy. I'm sure that there were sleepless nights. There was wailing and weeping on the part of Mordecai. Mordecai was literally just a few hours away from death, and yet God not just saved him, but elevated him within the kingdom. We don't always understand how God is working. Now, the thing about Esther is this. We read the story from start to finish. It's several years in the making, and, and the last part of it is a whole year in the making. And we see, oh yeah, see how God's at work. See, see what he does here. Isn't this great? Why? Because we see the end. But when you're in the middle of it, it's not so easy, is it? When you're right in the middle of it, it's hard. It's difficult. It's easy to lose hope. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. Some of you may have heard this verse before. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. That's a great verse, isn't it? I mean, this is the verse that they make T-shirts about. People get this verse tattooed probably, I'm assuming. You know what the context of this verse is? Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. You know what he's doing in Jeremiah 29? He's prophesying to those who are being taken into captivity. Because Jeremiah had been proclaiming that judgment was coming upon the nation of Israel. We pull Jeremiah 29, 11 out and say, this is a great verse. I'm gonna claim it for every situation. We need to understand the context of it. The context of it is that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, is coming into Jerusalem. He has surrounded it. He has cut off food and water. People are starving. Finally, they attack the city. They tear down the walls. They take the gold and the silver uh, instruments that were used for the worship of Jehovah God, and they steal those out of the temple and take them back to the treasury of, Nebuch uh, of Nebuchadnezzar. Not only that, they come back and they completely level the temple. That is the context of Jeremiah 29. In verse 10, and I didn't put it up on the screen, but he says this, for thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good work towards you and cause you to return to this place. And then he says, know the thoughts that I have for you. When Jeremiah 29, 11 was delivered, it was a horrible time for the Jewish people. 
And yet God was at work. Yes, he was judging the people, but he hadn't forgotten them. Yes, they were going through difficult times, but even in the middle of that, he was extending this promise. I have hope. I have good thoughts for you. I care about you. I love you. And we may feel like all hope is gone, but it's not. Not only that, but sometimes we think things are forgotten. I want to read these verses for you. I already told you the story in Esther 2 and verse 21. It says, in those days while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Bigthan and Teresh, those just sound like bad guys, don't they? Don't trust a guy named Bigthan. If your name's Bigthan, I'm sorry. They were doorkeepers. They became furious and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. And when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed, and both were hanged on gallows, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Mordecai goes through channels. He tells the queen. The queen tells the king. But she tells the king in the name of Mordecai. She wants Mordecai to get credit. And they record it. It's official. Mordecai was the one that foiled the plot. And you know what his reward was? Nothing. That's chapter 2 of Esther. What happens in chapter 3? The decrees issued by Haman, right? And how do you feel if, if you're Mordecai? Man, here I am saving the king's life, and the king is signing laws that are going to kill not just me, but all my people. I'm doing what's right, but what's coming to me is evil. Ever been there? Ever felt that way? You ever felt like you weren't appreciated? Like you were trying, you're, hey, I'm praying, I'm reading my Bible, I'm trying to do the right things, but only wickedness is coming my way. Where's my reward? How come Haman is being elevated in the kingdom? I'm the one that's not looking out for my own interest. I'm the one looking out for the interest of the king, and yet I'm not rewarded, and Haman is. I've been there before. I felt like, God, what are you doing? I'm trying to serve you. But things were not forgotten. Funny how God just happened to save this for one night when the king couldn't sleep. And funny how that happened to just be the night before the morning that Haman was going to kill Mordecai. You think Mordecai would have felt better if he'd have gotten a little bit of cash back when the plot was discovered? Probably not, right? But just because we think something's forgotten doesn't mean it is. Matthew chapter 6, and verse number 5, Jesus says this. Talking to his disciples about how they ought to pray, he says, when you pray, you should not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by man. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will what? Reward you openly. We can decide. Do we make sure we get the reward? Or do we leave it up to God? Because Jesus said that the hypocrites, when they would pray, they would stand on the corner. They would make sure they had an audience. They would make sure that everybody knew how spiritual they were. And Jesus said, that's their reward. They got what they were going for. My wife's down with the kids, but 
in our household, I'm going to admit something to you that if you know me at all and you know her at all, you already knew was true, and that is this. She does a lot more around the house than I do. You're supposed to go, oh, really? <laughs> no. It's true. But when I do something, I want to make sure she notices. You know? Like, if I'm going to empty the dishwasher, maybe I'll just leave it open so she sees that it's empty. <laughs> oh, sorry. I must have got distracted when I was emptying the dishwasher. You know what? I have my reward. But we don't want to be that way with God. Do we trust in him? Listen. It does sometimes take some faith. There's no doubt about it because we look around and it seems like evil is rewarded and good is punished. It seems like things are upside down. But we serve a just God. And I can promise you this. You're not going to get to eternity and realize, oh, serving God just wasn't worth it. You know, I gave to God, but he never gave to me. Listen, when, when, when I was unlovely, he loved me. Before I could ever hope to do anything to, to reach to God, he reached down to me through his son, Jesus Christ. He loved me. He extended his love to me in the form of Christ who died for my sin, who rose again to show victory over sin and death. The Bible says before, he, before I could ever love him, he loved me. We love him, why? Because he first loved us. We, we, we serve him and we give to him. Why? Because he first gave to us. Listen, if God never blessed me one time, what I've got waiting for me in eternity, I could never even come close to, to, to trying to pay back to God. And you know what? He does bless us. He does watch out for us. He does provide for our needs. Even when it seems like things are forgotten, they're not. And finally, just because God seems absent doesn't mean he is. You know the interesting thing about Esther? God's not mentioned one time in the whole book. Matter of fact, even when Esther says fast, she doesn't say pray. There's an assumption that there's prayer. There's an assumption there that when Mordecai says that deliverance will rise up for the Jews, that he is looking to Jehovah God and trusting in God. God is all over that book, but his name is never mentioned. It's as if these events take place and God's not at work at all, but we know that that is not the case. We see the fingerprints of God all over Esther, the book of Esther, so much so that even today, the Jews celebrate a feast commemorating the day in which God gave them this great victory. But just because we don't think God's there doesn't mean he's not. Hebrews chapter 13, and I want to close with this this morning. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? See, there's nothing like a companion. There's nothing like companionship. I've kind of talked about this before, but 
I love to spend time in the mountains. And one of the things that I enjoy doing is, is hunting in the fall. And, and, and a lot of times you, you want to stay out there until, until it's getting dark. That's, that's kind of the, some of the best time. But you know what happens is then it gets dark. And most of the time, I try to be real strategic. I try to know right where I am and right how I can get back to the road to my truck or, or maybe a four-wheeler so that I can get back to camp. I don't want to be left out in the dark, and I certainly don't want to do it by myself. Because here's the thing. If you're out in the dark and you're with a buddy, it's a different dynamic. You say, well, I think we ought to go this way. I think I'm on that trail. And, and your buddy goes, yeah, yeah, here's, here's your footprint. I can see it from before. We're good. Oh, okay, great. And, and you, that gives you confidence. You've got someone to talk to. But man, you're by yourself. You're like, well, I think that's the right way. But it's dark and it looks different. You can begin to doubt. You can feel like you're alone. And that is a bad feeling. Some of you may say, oh, I like being by myself. All right, well, it's a bad feeling for me. Because I just started imagining what's going to happen, you know. I'll be that guy that's like, well, we found his footprints, and he just went in a circle like <laughs> 20 times. And then we found him like this, frozen. Clearly, you guys would be distraught about the whole thing. Man. But if you're, if you're with someone, it changes the dynamic. It feels different. And Hebrews gives us the promise, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Listen, think about where Esther and Mordecai were. It was the Babylonian empire that it, that it destroyed Jerusalem. Maybe Mordecai was old enough to remember, although he was probably born in captivity. Certainly Esther would have been. She never knew of Jerusalem. She'd probably never been there. She'd certainly never seen the temple, and she never would because it was destroyed. She's in a foreign land, foreign language, foreign culture. And yet she's told about the God who, who loves her. She's told that she's one of God's chosen people, one of the Jewish people, but it doesn't seem like it. It seems like, matter of fact, it's not the Jews that seem blessed, it's the Persians. They defeated the Babylonians and now their empire extends through much of the, that area, much of the known world at that time. And we know as followers of Jesus that God loves us. We know that, that we're to obey his commands and that he's going to bless us. But sometimes it doesn't feel like that in this world, does it? Sometimes we feel outnumbered, outgunned. And it's easy to think that God is not with us. But just as he was at work in, in the life of Esther and Mordecai, so he is with us and he has promised us he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. I don't know what you're going through this morning. I don't know what circumstances you're dealing with and I certainly don't want to minimize those today. Some of you may be dealing with some health issues. Some of you may be facing some catastrophic financial decisions. Some of you may be just wrecked in your relationships. I don't know what you're dealing with today, but I know this, God has not forgotten you. You may be in circumstances where you say, all hope is lost. Can I tell you, it is not. Just by the fact that you are here in this place today is evidence that God cares for you. He wants you to hear this message, this point of encouragement today. 
That doesn't mean that everything's going to be perfect. But it does mean that God is with us. And hope is not lost. And he has not forgotten you. Let's bow our heads and pray this morning. Dear God, Lord, I thank you for the story of Esther, Mordecai. God, we don't always understand how you work, but Lord, we believe that you are always at work. God, we don't always understand what you're doing in this world, but we know, God, that you are working to bring glory to yourself and to use us for that end. God, I pray for those that are here this morning that you would just encourage them in the circumstances that they find themselves. God, I pray that you would just just encourage them and, and help them to know that you have not forgotten them, that you are with them, God. Lord, I just pray. I pray, God, that you would just encourage us today that we might be an encouragement and a blessing to others. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen.